Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. I'm going to continue here with reading uh, Joseph Shah's Muhammadan jurisprudence. And um, so last time we left off on page uh, 16, uh, paragraph uh, number two, which starts with All this applies to traditions from the Prophet only. Shafi'i distinguishes sharply between them and traditions from companions and others. Even in his terminology, he generally reserves the term athar for the latter. Traditions from companions carry no authority when they conflict with information from the Prophet. They are not of the same standing and are irrelevant beside them. One, One of the most detailed statements to this effect occurs in Ikhtilaf uh, 138. I believe, I believe that, that was Ikhtilaf uh, al-Hadith or Kitab Ikhtilaf al-Hadith. Yep. Okay, so that, so that you can see, you can see that, that on page 13, 13 if you're interested there. So continuing, continuing on page 17. 17. The only criterion for the reliability of a tradition is its transmission from the prophet by reliable men, and the fact that some companions have agreed with it does not strengthen it, nor does the fact that some companions have acted against it warrant its rejection, because they are themselves together with Muslims dependent on the orders of the prophet and not qualified to confirm them or to detract them by their concurring or dissenting opinions. If it is objected that a tradition from the prophet becomes suspect if some companions act differently, the tradition regarding the action of those companions may as well be suspected for the same reason or both be suspected equally, but what is transmitted from the prophet deserves more consideration. As to opinions which are not transmitted from the prophet, nobody may regard them as going implicitly back to him because some companions were unaware of the orders of the prophet and they must be quoted only as their private opinions as long as the companion does not relate them from the prophet. If one pretends that the opinion of a companion cannot have originated but, but with, with the prophet, prophet one ought never, never to disagree with the opinions of the companion in question, yet, yet there is no man after the prophet whose opinions are not partly accepted and partly rejected in favor of those of another companion. Only the words of the prophet can be rejected on account of the opinions of another. And so here basically what Shah is trying to do is he is trying to give you a summary of Shafi'i's uh, hadith criticism, his theory of hadith criticism, um, you know, his usul hadith, if you will, um, which is, of course, a part of usul fiqh. You know, each of the four uh, schools of Islamic jurisprudence have their own ideas as to how to approach hadith in, in terms, terms of fiqh, fiqh. and they, and they have, have a different criterion uh, than, uh, than just the, what, what you might call a hadith or muhadithi, or muhadithi, muhadithun. Um, uh, so, so, you know, they're, they're working with different epistemologies, and I think uh, Muslims, Muslims nowadays often forget that, that. but that's, that's a really, really important, important uh, point that we still got to keep in consideration here. here. They, they all make, make their, their own different arguments, arguments as, as to what hadith should be accepted and why, um, how, how to deal, deal with, contradictions, with contradictions, what, what uh, you know, you know, levels uh, have different authority, authority like uh, what, what types of hadith, hadith are more authoritative than others, you know, can we use morsel hadith, hadith or, you know, munqati hadith, you know, the ones that are cut or, you know, it's just from, from like a tab a relating, relating to the, to the prophet, prophet and, and things, things like that. that. Um, so, so basically, Shaq is trying to give a summary. summary. So, to so to continue here, here as, as he did with his doctrine on traditions from the prophet, prophet Shafi'i claims that this supplement to it is common ground for him and his opponents, opponents particularly the Iraqians. 
But again, but again it, is it is obvious from Shafi'i's sustained polemics and, and from passages such as Treatise Number 8, page 40, that he forces his point of view on them, rejects their rudimentary theory, and puts them in a position which leaves them without justification for their different attitude. In Shafi'i's view, it is ignorance to interpret a sunnah of the Prophet in light of a tradition from a companion, as if it would be confirmed thereby. Traditions from others than the Prophet ought rather to be interpreted in light of what is related from the Prophet, Treatise No. 1, page 51. He even goes so far as to say that the words of the Prophet are better, are a better indication of what the Prophet meant than the statement of another person, and that no conclusions on what the Prophet meant can be drawn except from his own words. Hadith, page 325. The tradition of a companion from the Prophet must prevail over the differing action of the same companion. Treatise number 2, page 3. Shafi'i's own reasoning does not always reach this standard, but no sacrifice of principle is involved when he argues ad hominem from traditions from companions against the representatives of the ancient schools. On the other hand, Shafi'i does not hesitate to use traditions from companions as additional evidence besides information from the Prophet on his sunnah. This is sometimes meant also as an argument ad hominem, but mostly not, and it plays indeed a considerable part in Shafi'i's reasoning in Treatise No. 1, Treatise No. 2, Treatise No. 3, and elsewhere. Occasionally, Shafi'i uses traditions from the first four caliphs, or from companions and from later authorities, in order to show, in the style of the ancient schools of law, the continuity of doctrine from the time of the prophet, from the time the prophet gave his ruling or performed his model action. Apart from this, Shafi'i often uses traditions from companions as authorities in cases where no tradition from the prophet are available. He says explicitly, as long as there exists a ruling in Qur'an and Sunnah, those who are aware of it have but to follow them. If it does not exist, we turn to the opinion of the companions of the prophet or of one of them, and we prefer the opinion of the caliphs Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman. If no opinion, opinion is available from the caliphs, the other companions of the Prophet have a sufficient status in religion to justify us in following their opinion, and we ought rather to follow them than those who come after them. And he uh, quotes Treatise Number 3, page 148. This reference to the opinions of the companions is called taqlid. It was common to Shafi'i and the ancient schools of law while Shafi'i, as a matter of principle, subordinated traditions from companions to traditions from the Prophet and his Sunnah. He nevertheless attacked both the Iraqians and the Medanese for not following the traditions from the companions consistently enough. Notwithstanding his reference to the position of authority occupied by the companions of the Prophet, Shafi'i is unable to produce a stringent argument in favor of accepting their opinions. Question. Question. What, do what do you say of the opinions of the companions of the Prophet if they disagree? Answer. We adopt, we adopt those which agree with the Qur'an or the Sunnah or the Ijma' consensus or the opinions, opinions of a single companion, companion on which neither agreement nor, nor disagreement of the others is known, is an, is an argument in favor of adopting them to be found in the Qur'an or Sunnah or consensus? Answer, there is, there is no, no argument in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah, and the scholars sometimes adopt the opinion of a single companion and sometimes discard it, and differ concerning some of those opinions which they adopt. Shafi'i's own attitude is to follow them if there is no ruling in the Qur'an or Sunnah or the consensus, nor anything that can be deduced from the, these sources by analogy. But it, but it is rare, rare to find an opinion of an isolated, isolated companion, companion which is which not contradicted by another. It says, Basala 82. 
So, so Shafi'i is, is reduced to repeating the argument of the ancient schools. The companions, the companions knew, knew the meaning of the Quran, Quran best, best and their, their opinion. opinion. We, tr we trust, we trust does, does not disagree with the Quran. The Quran. And uh, uh, he says that's Kitab Um, um it, it says uh, number seven, maybe that's volume seven, seven uh, uh, page 20. 20. But, but this is inconsistent because he refuses as a matter of principle to assign the companions the same role with regard to the Sunnah of the Prophet insofar as the companions act as transmitters of traditions from the Prophet. Shafi'i claims that all are reliable thanks to Allah's grace. Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, page 360. But he does not yet know the tradition from the Prophet which was to be used later to justify reference to them as authorities. My companions are like lotus stars. Traditions from companions are superseded not only by explicit traditions from the Prophet, but by analogical and other conclusions drawn from these last. And he says that's a treatise number three and number nine. They are, they are not, not superseded, superseded by, by later, later authorities, authorities or by, by personal, personal opinion. opinion. Ra'i. In, In his earliest treatises, Shafi'i followed, followed traditions from companions, companions even if they, they went against systemic or systematic analogy. analogy. But, but later, though, though still in his early period, he let, he let analogy, analogy prevail. prevail. He interprets, he interprets traditions from companions in the same harmonizing way as he does traditions from the prophet, but shows his reserved attitude to them by his frequent doubts as to whether they are well authenticated. Traditions from the successors, i.e. Tabi'in, the generation following that of the companions, i.e. Sahaba, of the prophet, enjoy still less authority. Traditions from companions are preferable to those from successors or at least equal to them. Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, page 51. Opinions of successors are not a decisive argument, but although every systematic justification is lacking, Shafi'i uses them from time to time as subsidiary arguments or when higher authorities are not available. Shafi'i had to fight in order to secure for the, for the traditions, traditions from the prophet and, and the overriding authority, authority which he claimed for them, and in, and in particular to make them prevail over traditions, traditions from, from the companions. companions. He still recognized these last in a subordinate position but was unable to find a conclusive systematic justification for their use. The same applies even more to traditions from successors. We must conclude that his opponents, the adherents of the ancient schools of law, did not as yet acknowledge the absolute precedence of traditions from the prophet, and argued mainly from traditions from companions and successors. The authority that Shafi'i still leaves to these is an unsystematic survival from the earlier period, and his preference as a matter of principle for the traditions from the Prophet is his great systematic innovation. So uh, one of the things here is uh, Shafi'i is always extremely uh, critical of Ra'i. And, you know, you have uh, this dichotomy be between what's called Ahl Ra'i and Ahl al-Hadith. And Ra'i literally means opinion, but Ra'a, it means, uh, you know, uh, to see or that you're looking at something he looked, he saw, um, something of that nature. And it also means that he held an opinion. Um, and so uh, when you read uh, Kitab al-Asl from Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, the student of Abu Hanifa, um, you'll find it Ara'ayta kada wa kada so he'll be a asking Abu Hanifa is it your opinion such and such or this or that you know um, and 
then uh, Abu Hanifa he may answer something like Ra'yi kada wa kada. My opinion is you know such and such. And so they became known as the Ahl Ra'i. Um, but Ra'i here when Shafi'i is using it in the way that Shah uses it also, I interpret it um, that it means istihsan. So istihsan, it's a uh, form 10 of the Arabic verb hasana. Um, and so it literally means like seeking the good. Um, and, you know, if you look at my videos on the history of the Hanafi Madhab, I talk about Hanafi epistemology. And istihsan is basically, it's translated sometimes as juristic preference or uh, juristic discretion, um, things like that. So uh, there's an entire chapter in Kitab al-Asl from Muhammad Shaybani that's called, uh, you know, Bab al-Istihsan. And in this uh, chapter, basically, he is using personal uh, judgment to come up with rulings on issues where um, there might not be reports about, or uh, according to the Hanafi epistemology, they don't accept reports uh, that may be pertinent to this, according to Shafi'i. And so it's not quite Qiyas, although it can sometimes look like Qiyas. Um, it's more like, uh, you know, later scholars would describe it as doing what's for the greater good or the muslaha. You know, in, in Maliki Madhab, they tend to call it istislah. Um, and uh, Shafi'i calls it istishab. And he different, makes it a little bit different than istihsan, which he's so critical of. Um, and, you know, the, the Hanabila, they also have uh, something similar that they developed later on. Um, but essentially, you know, every uh, ruling, they try to find the illa behind it or the legio, uh, uh, the, uh, basically, what's the aim or intention or reason for that ruling? And based on that, uh, when it's applied on the ground in real life, does it have the intended effect? If it does not have the intended effect, but rather has the opposite effect due to culture or political circumstances or both, um, you know, other types of circumstances, then uh, they may, due to istihsan, change the ruling to something that may fit better the intention behind that ruling. Um, so, you know, this may relate to criminal law, it may relate to ibadah, it may relate to, uh, you know, medical procedures and, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, Shafi'i, basically, he uses, like, polemics um, against the Hanafis and trying to say that they don't really have uh, systematic epistemology that's well thought out when they're doing istihsan. Um, it's more willy-nilly, and, uh, you know, there's some problems with it, essentially, is what Shafi'i is getting to when he calls, when he, you know, talks about Ra'i. He's talking about uh, istihsan here. And, you know, in Kitab al-Asl from Muhammad bin al-Hassan al-Shaybani, um, in every single volume of the book, and it's about, it's 12 volumes in modern uh, print in the 2012 edition, um, every single volume has uh, mentions of istihsan. They're like, you know, we we uh, deduce this ruling through istihsan or istihsana or you know uh, he might say something like Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani uh, istihsana wa you know qasa Abu Hanifa and you know Abu Hanifa came up with his opinion through qiyas through juristic analogy whereas Muhammad Shaybani and Abu Yusuf you know they both did istihsan to come up with their ruling and in this uh, circumstance. So um, I think Kitab al-Asl is 
uh, very important in regards to this. And like I mentioned earlier in, you know, the earlier videos in the series here, um, Kitab al-Asl is one of the books that uh, Yosef Shach himself admits uh, he did not have access to. It was confiscated by the Egyptian authorities. So he himself did not get to use that book. Now I'm going to begin with chapter 4, Traditions in the Ancient Schools of Law. The attitude of the Iraqians and the Medanese to legal traditions is essentially the same. That's really bold to say, and I don't think anybody agrees with that in current scholarship. The attitude of the Iraqians and the Medanese to legal traditions is essentially the same and differs fundamentally from that of Shafi'i Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, page 30, shows that both the Iraqians and the Medanese neglect traditions from the Prophet in favor of systematic conclusions from general rules or of the opinions of the companions. Shafi'i argues first, uh, page 33, or page 30, excuse me, I suppose that's still from Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, against the Medanese from the point of view of the Iraqians, and then page 34, in turn against these, he says, these same arguments apply to you when you follow the same method with regard to other traditions from the Prophet. He states that both groups of opponents use the same arguments and that his own arguments are against and his own arguments against both are the same. And he uses each party in order to refute the other. There are several other passages to the same effect. So essentially what's going on here is um, if you look at my videos on the history of the Hanafi Madhab, um, the Hanafis they put the Qur'an above all else. And a, a general Qur'anic statement, a Qur'anic verse that is am, that is general, cannot be overridden by a prophetic hadith that is khos, that is specific. The Hanafis looked at that as being a contradiction. No matter how strong the hadith is, if it contradicts the Qur'an and tries to specify something the Qur'an made general, then it's thrown out. It can't possibly be true. Why would it be contradicting the Qur'an? You know, or that companion maybe was mistaken, or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and through that method, uh, they, there are hadith that they exclude from fiqh. And um, according to Shakhtir, I'm not so sure if it's true, I'm not uh, the most knowledgeable on Maliki usul al-Hadith, um, but he says that the Malikis more or less do the same as the Hanafis. And so Shafi'i, you know, what Shafi'i is all about is specifying Quranic statements with prophetic hadith. So he's trying to refute the Hanafis in that regard and saying, no, if there's a Quranic statement which is am, which is general, then a hadith which is khos, which is specific, is specifying that Quranic ayah, that verse in Quran. So, in other words, the hadith are used to explain the Quran in that regard, and it, what may be general in the Quran becomes specified because of a hadith, prophetic hadith. And so it's more or less the opposite of what Abu Hanifa did. And we know Shafi'i studied under Muhammad bin al-Hassan al-Shaybani. So here he's refuting his former teacher, basically. Shafi'i finds their attitude a mass of inconsistencies. You diverge from what you yourselves relate from Ibn Umar and from what others relate from the Prophet without following the opinion of any companion or successor from whom you might transmit it, as far as I know. I do not know why you transmit traditions if you transmit them in order to show that you know them and diverge from them in full knowledge. You have achieved your purpose and shown that you diverge from the doctrine of our forebears. If you transmit them in order to follow them, you are mistaken when you neglect them, and you neglect much of the little that you transmit. 
if the proof in your opinion does not lie in traditions, why do you go with the trouble of transmitting them at all? Using that part of them with which you agree as an argument against those who disagree. Treatise number three, page 146. So Shafi'i is asking the Malikis and Hanafis, why is it that you are transmitting hadith, that you're giving a rawaya, that you're maybe doing a qira'a of hadith and their students coming there for sama'a? You know, like you're reading, you're reciting these hadith, students are there listening, and it's being transmitted, maybe ijazas are being given, and so on and so forth. And all these hadith that you're transmitting, how come you're not applying them in your fiqh? Why do you even bother transmitting them? You know, why do you have these hadith if you're not even going to use them for fiqh? And of course, Hanafis will say, you know, well, these hadith are still important for X, Y, and Z reasons, um, even though we don't use them in fiqh. And so, you know, here it's just kind of, um, it feels very polemical um, from Shafi'i, just kind of like he's just trying to get a jab rather than make a real uh, systemic argument there. Even if this and other passages were not part of Shafi'i's polemics, it would be obvious from the sources other than his writings that they give no complete picture of the attitude of the ancient schools of law to tradition. And there's a footnote, compare Shafi'i's caricature in treatise number 3, page 65, with Malik's statement of his doctrine in Tabari 81. And we shall investigate the unifying idea behind this seeming inconsistency in chapter 7. For the moment, we are concerned with the actual treatment of traditions from the Prophet and others in the ancient schools. The first striking fact is is that the traditions from the prophet are generally outnumbered by those from companions and successors. So basically, uh, the uh, different hadiths or narrations or, you know, athar that are from the companions, the sahaba and the tabi'een, the, uh, you know, followers, the, there's way more of those than there actually is uh, prophetic hadith. I think a lot of people even now, they don't know that because, you know, later on in the Islamic tradition, you have, you know, a, a sitta as sahiha or the six canonical hadith books, namely Bukhari, uh, Muslim, you have Tirmidhi, Nisa'i, Abu Dawood, uh, and who, who, am I, who am I missing? Uh, Ibn Majah. And so... Before those hadith collections, you had uh, Musannif ibn Abi Shayba, uh, you had Musannif Abdul Razak al Sanani, and of course, everyone knows Muwatta, Musnad Shafi'i, Musnad Abi Hanifa, Kitab al Athar from Abi Hanifa. And so, you know, there was many hadith books that existed, and I'm just scratching the surface in that regard. Um, and they are f chock full of narrations from the Sahaba, Tabi'een, and Tabi'at Tabi'een. As regards to the Madanis, Malik's Muwatta contains, according to one of the lists quoted by Zurqani, 822 traditions from the Prophet against 898 from others, that is, 613 from companions and 285 from successors. The edition of the Muwatta by Shaybani contains, according to the commentary, 429 traditions from the Prophet against 750 from others, that is, 628 from companions, 112 from successors, and 10 from later authorities. In treatise number three, where Shafi'i discusses the points on which the Egyptian Medanese diverge from traditions transmitted by themselves, Deal with, uh, so he says, page 1 through 61, deal with traditions from the prophet. Page 63 through 147, with traditions from others, mostly from companions. Page 101 and 105 through 108, deal with traditions from successors and later authorities. As regards, to, as regards the Iraqians, the references of Ibn Abi Layla, Abu Hanifa, and Abu Yusuf to the Prophet in Treatise Number 1, 
where Shafi'i discusses the inter-Iraqi differences of doctrine, are much less numerous than those to, to companions and, su- and successors. The Kitab al-Athar of Abu Yusuf contains 189 traditions from the Prophet, 372 from companions, 549 from successors. In the incomplete Kitab al-Athar of Shaybani, we find 131 traditions from the Prophet, 284 from companions, and 550 from successors, and 6 from later authorities. Only the Syrian Awza'i in the fragments which are preserved in Treatise uh, 9 and in Tabari refers to the Prophet much more frequently than companions, but mostly in general terms and without a proper isnad. Also, the subject matter sets these historical traditions apart from the legal traditions proper. So I have a, a video also on Imam al awzai and mostly focuses on the work of uh, Steve Steve Judd, um, who has researched uh, Awza'i quite extensively. And, um, you know, I talk about uh, some of the hadiths that, uh, you know, he uses. Um, you know, one of the great uh, sources on Awza'i is, you know, Rad ala siyar al-Awza'i. Um, uh, which I believe is by Abu Yusuf, and then you also have, uh, you know, like Ikhtilaf al Fuqaha from Tabari, which is what I think uh, Shah is trying to allude allude to here. Um, so we're on page 22, and I'm going to stop it here before section A, the Medanese, and we can uh, continue there uh, in the next reading. Uh, thank you very much for listening in. Sorry if there's any kind of echo here. I'm still trying to learn uh, this whole streaming thing so hopefully it'll be more uh, streamlined here in the future pun intended Um, don't forget to give the video a like to subscribe Um, please check out my patreon you can even donate as less uh, less as less as one dollar a month if if you're so inclined or even more if if you like me that much Um, Every little bit helps the channel and helps me, uh, you know, free up more of my time uh, to do this type of work for you guys. Um, thank you very much for listening. Ma'asalama.